uh, developer advocate at Cube First. Uh, what we do is cloud native. We basically give you an open source uh, free tool to create a production ready Kubernetes cluster with all the tools you need to manage your CD pipeline, secrets, to manage like everything you need to be production ready. But I'm not here to talk about our product today. I'm not here to talk about Cube First. I'm here to talk to you about what the heck is Kubernetes. By the way, during that talk, feel free to uh, share stuff on Twitter. I don't know if I, I still call this Twitter. There is no way I'm going to call this X. Uh, so uh, feel free to share things on Twitter that you agree, disagree, things that I've said that are good, bad. Uh, take pictures of the slide of my beautiful face, whatever. I'm on Twitter if uh, it's Hef Harper. Feel free to connect also. Um, other thing, if you have any question you don't want to ask publicly, uh, Twitter is also a good place to ask questions. Obviously, I'm not going to watch my Twitter account during the talk, but after that, I'm going to take the time to uh, check if there's any question, comments, or insult. So what the heck is Kubernetes? Before we start about that topic, I want to tell you, when I uh, decided to write that talk, like write the abstract, the title, I was like, that's a brilliant idea. Like That's the talk that I wanted to have when I started my cloud native journey. And when the talk got accepted, and I had to create that talk, I was like, that was a bad idea. That was really a bad idea. Actually, it was not a bad idea. It's just because like, there is so much thing about Cube for, uh, Cube first, Kubernetes that I was like, what should I talk about? Like, What would make sense within only an hour with those folks? And the thing is that that talk could be like a full day workshop. And I'm not even sure if we would have seen like everything that is Kubernetes. So, I did a lot of like thinking, talking to myself a little bit too much, and I decided that like that talk is going to be a mix between like a high-level introduction about Kubernetes, so like the fundamental of Kubernetes, so you won't know. Let's be honest, you won't know everything about Kubernetes at the end of that talk, but I also want to do some demos and hopefully help you get started when it comes to Kubernetes, or at least get you a little bit more excited or a little bit more like. What the hell is that? To understand just a little bit more the technology to maybe, maybe try it at home, maybe try to move your traditional cloud infrastructure to cloud native or Kubernetes, if that makes sense for you. So Kubernetes what? What is Kubernetes? But first, let me give you a warning. Actually, nobody's going to listen to me for the next 30 seconds because you're all reading what is on the screen, except the people doing stuff on your computer that are not really listening to me right now. But the other people, it's still Bert. Uh, basically, what does that say? Uh, like, it's basically at the end, Kubernetes won't solve your issues, uh, or all your issues. So it's not a magic solution. If your application's not good, <laughs> not going to work. If your infrastructure is not well designed, it's not going to work also. So it's not a magic solution. I know it's used like that all the time when you hear about Kubernetes. Like everybody wants to like, move to Kubernetes. It wants, everybody wants to be cloud native. Uh, it may or may not be for you, depending on your need. But again, uh, it's not a magic solution. It won't solve all your needs. So I just thought it was a funny comic. Uh, and it, it's really like, you know, the reality for uh, some of us. I'm lucky right now. My bus are not like Dilbert uh, bus, but I used to have folks like that where like, yeah, they're just touring like keywords and like you should have like solved every issues we had or every problem. With that said, how many of you felt like that when you started to like more, you wanted to read a little more about Kubernetes and were like, yeah, I have no exactly idea what it is. You can raise your hand. I was like that. The other people, you were just lying. You're just a liar. <laughs> you were probably like that because in the end, Kubernetes is not a lot of new things, but it's a lot of like best practices that we put together. And it brings a lot of new terms that we never heard before, which is the complicated thing. It's a powerful but complex product for some complex cases that you have. So I felt like that when. I was like, OK, I need to do some cloud native stuff. Uh, I need to learn about that. And uh, that was a little bit too much. So 
Hopefully this talk won't be too much. Uh, I tried to cram a couple of things within the hour, but at the same time I tried to like keep it low. So you tell me that's the first time I'm giving that talk. So you tell me if like an, at the end of a format of one hour was like good enough for people starting. But so what is Kubernetes? And you've probably seen like K8S uh, is just another way to say Kubernetes. It's basically like the number eight is like the number of characters between K and S. So it's just the, it's just for the cool kids. We say K W uh, K8S. Uh, it's just Kubernetes is so long to type, like, <laughs> anyway. So uh, you can see Kubernetes or K, uh, K8S, uh, which seems to be longer to say K8S than Kubernetes, but, like, it's faster to type. So uh, it's, what is Kubernetes? It's a open source container orchestrations. It helps you orchestrate container, like that's written there. This is what it does. It's really going to improve scalability for your, uh, whatever you need to deploy on the cloud. It helps with high availability. I don't know why I struggle with that one in English, high availability. It is resource efficient, depending on how you use it, depending on like if you know how to use it, but just like every other technology. And it is also, there is also self-healing capab capabilities that I'm gonna demo you at the end of the talk, uh, really interesting. Uh, it really makes your life easier when things go down, uh, depending on the reasons Kubernetes is going to be able to fire up, like, again, your application. I'm going to show you a little bit how it's going to work. There's also a simple stateless disaster recovery model, because it's easy for you to roll back to previous version of what you deploy on your cluster. You really make it easier. There's also... Uh, Way of doing things in Kubernetes that you don't have to do is called GitOps. I'm not going to talk too much about GitOps, but uh, the point is, is that Git becomes your source of truth. So everything you put in your cluster should be in your Git repo. And it even makes, it's not part of Kubernetes per se, it's just like one uh, like way of doing things when it comes to uh, running a Kubernetes cluster. And it also makes even easier the uh, stateless disaster recovery model because Git becomes your source of truth and everything is in Git. So it's really easier to save the day when something is going wrong. And there's portability. And I put it in italic. I know the, uh, the screen is a little bit small for that size of room and like it's a little bit low. I did not anticipate that. Uh, I put portability in italic because communities per se, it's a portable technology. Where it becomes less portable even if all cloud provider tells you like there is no vendor locked in, it's like when you go with the bigger cloud, like AWS, Google Cloud, uh, Azure, uh, depending on the technology you're going to use, because there are free managed Kubernetes clusters for you, depending on the technology you use within your infrastructure, it may make it a little less portable. But it's not Kubernetes' fault. Is like how those cloud provider implemented it, which is usually not the case with the smaller player like DigitalOcean or Sivo, where the offer is really straightforward and they don't have like 10 to 20 to 30 services to help you manage your Kubernetes cluster. So there is a little less vendor locked in. But Kubernetes at the foundation, it's created so it's easier for you to move from on premises to public cloud to one or the other public clouds because. Uh, mostly everything you do is going to be defined in YAML file. With that said, brief story, just because I find it a little bit fascinating and uh, because I like to understand uh, when there is a technology like that that will basically take over everything in my cloud, like where if I decide to replace my more traditional cloud uh, the way that I hosted my application to Kubernetes, I want to understand a little bit, like, is it technology that makes sense for me? So just a brief history, because I liked it. Uh, in 2003, Google created Kubernetes, but it was called Borg. That was, someone said the, uh, yeah, you need uh, small these stickers. I need, like, you know, those stickers that you give to kids when they give you the great answers. That's good. Yeah, so it was called Borg. Uh, I think at some point, a year after or two years, they, they changed it for Omega. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, the initial name was Borg, but it was an internal project, which I assume, I don't know how the story, but which I assume was uh, because they needed a technology to be able to scale because, you know, it's Google. Uh, I don't know which services were available at that time, but like just like the biggest, like Google search, uh, just YouTube probably take a lot of like cloud power just to make it happen. So they developed this internally to their own need. But in 2014, so a couple of years ago, they were like, hey, you know what? That's a great technology. And a couple of engineers at Google were like, 
yeah, we need to open source that. So they decided to open source the project, they changed the name to Kubernetes, and this is really when we started to hear a little bit about it. That was still not popular, that was the early beginning, but the year after, in 2015, it started to become a thing. There is that uh, CNCF, Cloud Native uh, Computer Foundation, that is like a, kind of like a sub org of like Linux, Linux Foundation. That uh, partnered with Google to really like make Kubernetes what it is to open source it. So Google basically, and I'm like paraphrasing, but like gave the project to CNCF and like they become the owner of Kubernetes. So it's not owned per se per Google. I assume they're like probably their team are like the biggest contributor to the project still. But uh, it, is not, uh, it is not a Google project anymore. So for those of you that were like, hey, Fred, we're like in the Linux slash like open source or like free software conference and you're talking about Google, do not be afraid. Now it's under the umbrella of the CNCF. And uh, the CNCF doesn't have only Kubernetes. They have a lot of cloud-native technology projects that are under the umbrella of the CNCF. But it was not the only thing. They also start uh, in 2016. Uh, Actually, I'm missing one thing. I think it's 20, uh, yeah, okay, it's 2016. So in 2016, there's one technology that I'm gonna show you that's gonna become one of your best friends called Elm. That was created and released. The first version was, really, was released in 2016. They also created the first KubeCon conference, which is the holy grail of conference when it comes to uh, communities because it's organized by CNCF. It is huge. Uh, and uh, I assume it was not that huge in 2016. I was not there. But now it is pretty huge. It's uh, twice a year, once in Europe, once in North America. Uh, it's the place to be if you want to learn more about communities. There is a lot of vendors there. There is like a huge hall of like hexposing. Uh, so it started in 2016. So it's become, it became a little more serious because now we had a conference. In 2017, this is where the thing really started to pick up. It was enterprise. Enterprises started to like go uh, and jump in the Kubernetes train. So AWS started to give like a public offering, uh, like managed Kubernetes offering. Uh, Docker went all in when it comes to Kubernetes. So within uh, Docker desktop, you can like create Kubernetes cluster. Uh, like they really went all in. And a company like GitHub, so pre Microsoft acquisition. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, Pre-Microsoft acquisition, GitHub, like GitHub was running on Kubernetes. So just to give you an example of one company that trusted Kubernetes, like had the beginning hish, uh, was GitHub. And uh, we probably all use GitHub, uh, or maybe GitLab or other technology, but like I would say many people use GitHub. So uh, it's, it was, uh, or it probably is still working on Kubernetes. Which brings us to today, it's kind of like the de facto now for Many medium to large size company using Kubernetes, but also mostly every startups uh, right now, or actually before in a previous life, a couple of years ago, I was working at DigitalOcean, and part of my job was to work with startups. And every startup technical founders were asking me, like, okay, like I'm building my infrastructure for my application, like I need to go cloud native. Uh, so like every startup, like it was the kind of like the cool new things to work on. Uh, as I said before, uh, it may or may not fill your need. What I was telling to those folks at the time is like, maybe don't spend time in the fort right now to understand Kubernetes because it's a complex thing. While you're still building your product, you may not have users, you may not even have paid users. But if there is a way for you to architecture your application so it's gonna be easier after that to move to uh, cloud native uh, and Kubernetes. So just a quick brief story. If I want to create a cluster, so this is the easiest part when it comes to uh, working with Kubernetes. So you tell me it's gonna be big enough. Uh, there's a couple of ways to do that. So uh, there's a couple of tools where you can create cluster locally on your own machine. Uh, so you don't have to pay a public cloud to try it, to test it. Most of those tools give you the same-ish experience that you're gonna have in the public cloud. Uh, some popular one, uh, there is like Kine, uh, there is Minikube, and uh, I use Key3D for different reasons. So here what I can do, I have a Key3D, it's a CLI installed on my machine, and I can say Key3D, uh, create cluster and uh, demo Key3D. And actually it's the other way around. It's Key3D cluster, create. Yeah, 
how do you call it? Demo key 3D. And I don't know how to type. Technology is hard. Foster. Oh, there we go. So what's going to happen here? I have my firewall asking me once in a while. But if I go in Docker, so it's using Docker desktop here. Uh, oh, it's already there. If I look for key 3D, you're going to see now it's like creating some containers for me. It's running. It's going to run uh, Kubernetes version in my Docker machine. So now, in theory, actually not in theory, in practice, I have Kubernetes running on my machine. What does that mean? Not that much. I have a cluster. I have nothing really running on it except like the Kubernetes technology that makes the cluster the cluster. I'm going to tell you a little more what is exactly a cluster. So if I use, and I'm going to tell you about kubectl after, but if I get pods, and I'm going to explain what the pods are, just bear with me right now, but just to show you that something exists. In my uh, prompt here, you may see, I don't know if the people in the back, it's probably too low. Uh, you may see here, uh, I'm connected to my cluster automatically for different reasons. And I'm listing like all the pods that are inside my cluster. So those are the things that are installed by default when I use Key3D to create a cluster. So that's one way to create a cluster if you want to test your thing. After that, you can also go on public cloud. As I said, most public cloud, they have a managed Kubernetes uh, offering for you. Uh, the prices, the price is different from cloud to the other. Uh, I like Cebo. Uh, for two reasons, and transparency to just acquire us. So there's one reason why I like Sivo, but like I love them before. It's just a sample cloud that you know what you're going to pay for at the end of the day. And I can go, get, go here and say, like, create a new cluster. Make it a little bigger. And I'm going to give it the name. Nope. I'll click back. I'm going to click create cluster again. Sivo demo. Can choose the number of nodes. We'll get back to this, and uh, here I can define like what's going to be, uh, you know, the resources that I'm going to need on my nodes, which are basically the hardware or virtual uh, hardware that is running my Kubernetes cluster. I go here. I'm going to skip all this because it's specific to Sivo. But like, if I create here in one minute or two minutes, I'm going to have my Kubernetes cluster running in the cloud. So at that point, you're like, OK, good job, Fred. You have a cluster. Now what? Now let me explain to you, before I start to show you how to install application, let me explain to you a little bit what is a Kubernetes cluster. I think it's really important to understand the fundamentals. Uh, again, I'm going to focus on what I think is the most important to know right at the beginning. But I'll show you there is a lot more to know about Kubernetes, like I was saying at the beginning of the talk. So Kubernetes, in a nutshell, there is that cluster, which is everything like it contains my nodes to work my application. So the cluster is what I created with T3D cluster, the create comment. This is what I created on Sivo. This is basically my Kubernetes things running locally or in the cloud. But within the cluster, I have some nodes. I have in every cluster, I have one node called the master node. And the master node, it's basically a bunch of shit. Uh, to run Kubernetes. So I won't go in details for that because like, there is a lot of like, Kubernetes-specific technology that helps me to run my cluster in my application. I debated with myself if I wanted to talk about that. I was like, yeah, the first time I heard about this in a talk, they lost me totally. And that was not fundamental for me to understand how it's working. Like, I'm driving my car. I do not need to know like how exactly every piece is in the motor is working for me. Like in the engine, sorry, I don't know why I said the French word with the English accent, but in the engine, I don't need to know how, the, how the, every piece is working together. I know it's working. My car is going from point A to B. So it's a little bit of the thinking that I had when I say, like, hey, you know what, there is a lot of things related to Kubernetes. Just know that you have like that master node in every cluster that you create. Where the fun begins, because so far it's not that fun. Where the fun begins is when you go to the other type of node, which is the worker node. Think about the uh, machine or the resources, either the hardware, like physical hardware, or a virtual machine that is going to work. That's going to be basically where I'm going to put my whatever I need to run my application. So within my node, I have two specific things related to Kubernetes. And those I'm going to tell you just a little more. So you're going to have kubelet which is basically the interface between the master node and the worker node. 
So you don't have to worry that much about that. It's there. Uh, it's working. When you create your cluster, it's there. You don't have to do anything. But it's still good to know that it's there. And there is a second thing called the cube proxy, which is going to be what the node master is going to use to connect to your worker node or nodes and to be able to talk to kubelet. Or if you have part of your application that you want the external users to access, which is probably the goal at the end of the day, they're going to go through the cube proxy. But everything is transparent. It's just there. I just wanted you to know that. The exciting part, at least for me, you may not be as excited as me, but I am, is the container runtime. It is the smallest part of your Kubernetes cluster. They're called pods. And this is where, within your pods, you're going to run container or containers. So you can run one container with your application, two, three, four, how many containers you want. And it's depending on how you want to deploy your application. Let's say I want to deploy WordPress. WordPress is a PHP application. It uses MySQL by default as a database. I think you can change further databases, but like it's MySQL by default. And maybe what you want to do is have a pod where you're going to deploy WordPress. And I'm going to show you how to install an application uh, in a pod, how to deploy an application. So what do you would do in my example with WordPress? Maybe what you want to do is have WordPress, so a web server that have PHP support, a PHP extension that serve WordPress in one container. And you may want to have a second container, which have, you're going to have a second container is going to run MySQL, which is the database uh, that WordPress, WordPress needs. So what you want to do maybe is in your pod, in one pod, you install WordPress with the web server, Nginx, Apache. And on the second container, it is to running MySQL. So you would be able to do that. Or you would be able to have two pods with each one container. One container in pod one, which run WordPress with the web server. Second, con second pod with the another just one container that run MySQL, which is probably the best way to do that. But you have option for different reasons depending on like what you want to do. So just understand that the pod, it's a smaller part of your Kubernetes cluster. Container is not a Kubernetes technology per se, but like this is what you're going to use to run your application, and you can have multiple within a pod, and you can have multiple pod within your node worker. But on top of that, there is a lot more objects that you can use. So pod are one, but there is a lot of things. Config maps, where you want to have like different comp configurations about your different resources in your cluster. Uh, you can use deployment to deploy an application. I'm going to show you an example about that. Uh, ingress controller, where uh, it helps you, like there's an Nginx uh, ingress controller, which is quite popular, that helps you to like, basically offer your application to the rest of the world. You know, my WordPress uh, installation that I was talking about, it's probably for like, people that, are, that don't have access to my server to access like, any other application you publish on the web. You want people to be able to access it, so ingress controller is going to do that. You have job, and you have a lot of like, objects that helps you in your Kubernetes journey. And all those things are part of your node, of your worker node. And you can have multiple nodes, too. So that is Kubernetes in a nutshell. But I told you there is those other objects that I won't spend time to talk about today, because I think since the latest version, there is like 104 or six objects part of Kubernetes. So there's the list of other objects that you can use. I'm going to go fast-ish, so maybe you have the time to read a little bit. But like, there is a lot of objects that you can use within your node to do different things. There's job, there's cron job, there's ingress, network policy. Uh, there's na namespace. I'm going to talk a little more about that, because that's a really critical component of your um, community's journey. And there is a lot more. Secrets, secret store, so you can store secrets within your cluster. Uh, there is like a lot of objects that's going to help you. So um, again, I'm not going to talk about all those, because we're going to be there uh, at, until the end of the day for sure. And not all are exciting. But just know that the little, I don't like to say that. It's kind of like saying my talk is bad. But like the little you're going to know about you, uh, Kubernetes when you leave that room. There is a lot more of other stuff you can do to help you within your journey. But now today, we're going to start with uh, your, the beginning. For your Kubernetes journey, you need best friends. And I'm not talking about your coworker or people that you go have drinks after the day. I'm talking about uh, 
principally, I selected three technologies that's going to be part of your journey. Those are the three technologies that I feel you absolutely need to be successful. So the first one, which the logo means, with all respect for the graphic designer, doesn't really tell you what that is. Uh, it's kubectl, so the common line that I use uh, uh, before to show you the content or part of the content that was part of my cluster. The second technology is Helm. I'm going to explain a little bit what it is after. And the third one is uh, canines. Uh, which is also another great tool that uh, you can use to help you. So let me start with the first one, kubectl. Kubectl basically, well, let me go back. Kubectl basically is the default CLI to do whatever you have to do with your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it is part of Kubernetes project. It is under CNCF. CNCF. There's not a lot of things you can do without, actually, there's probably nothing you can do within your cluster without kubectl. And I say kubectl, some people say kubectl because it's K-U-C-T-L. I call this kubectl. I think the other people are wrong, but that's another discussion. So uh, kubectl or kubectl is uh, the common line that's going to make your life better and worse at the same time because there is a lot of things you can do on the cluster. But anyway, that's the common line tool that you need to do most of the thing within your cluster. Uh, what you're going to see also, and you may see this in the demo, uh, even in the docs, they suggest to do an alias from kubectl to just the letter k. So if you see me type k, it's just because it's an habit uh, and it's basically kubectl. With that said, what I want to do now is I created some cluster. I want to deploy an application because my cluster is basically useless right now. It's just a Kubernetes cluster with nothing in it. So I want to deploy an application. And mostly everything you do within the Kubernetes world is YAML. How many of you know YAML? How many of you liked it? <laughs> There's a lot less people. Huh? I understand where you're coming from. I was a JSON person. Uh, I hated YAML with passion when I started to do a little more uh, Kubernetes stuff. I hated it for whatever reasons. You know, like. As much as I love like, my team well format and everything, like they were complaining because you were missing a space and so, stuff like that, I just hated it. It took me time. And that's the story of everyone I know. Nobody is like, fuck yeah, yeah, no, that's nice. That's the best technology ever. With all respect for the people who created it, at the beginning, you hate it. But at some point, it becomes the best thing in your life. Because imagine if I'm trying to reproduce this with JSON, I'm a big JSON fan. I have to put brackets everywhere and double quotes everywhere, and it's a little less readable. Again, you found of JSON, but now I'm a little warm the YAML team for some of the stuff, and uh, this is one of the things because it's, it's readable. It's easier to read the YAML file. So you need to get used to YAML because that's your new life now if you go uh, Kubernetes way. So here, I'm using one of the other objects that I told you a uh, deployment object, that's going to be the definition of my deploy, like the kind of deployment, that's going to be the definition of a deployment that I want to do in my cluster. Here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, you always need to have like API version, haps uh, slash v1, the kind, in this kind, it's a deployment object. So I'm using this to deploy an application. I put some metadata, the name of my deployment is going to be Nginx, uh, the labels uh, is going to be Nginx to you because I'm, you know, I'm a sample person. Uh, there is a specification part where I can define the number of replicas. So how many pods do I want to deploy in my cluster? In that case, I'm going to keep it at one for the demo. But what's interesting with the pods, when I was saying that like, you can have multiple pods, it's not just for a separate application. It's part of the scalability and the high, high availability of Kubernetes, where if I install my server now, and let's say I'm still running WordPress, uh, and I install an Nginx server, and I'm going to put WordPress in it, and uh, I, have, I need to have multiple pods, because what's happening with the first pod? Like, there are so many people going on my website, and the first pod, like, the resources, like, cannot give, like, back uh, the HTTP response to people. So there is a way with like a load balancer or Kubernetes is going to be able like to point the users to different pods that still going to run your same application. What happened if I have an issue on my first pod? It failed, got killed, didn't work. Like you have other replicas, so that's super interesting. If I skip to the end, this is the interesting part. 
I don't know people in the back if you can see, but there's a spec exception within the template where I mention the containers, what I'm going to deploy to my application. So let me, let me show you maybe in a better way for the people in the back. Yeah, I use VI, I'm not cat on person. Uh, but I, you, I can, as you can see, I have VS Code, which, uh, which I like too. So um, there's the containers, again, name is Nginx, but what I'm seeing here, I'm saying, you know what, like the images that you use when you use Docker, I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna say, hey, what I want to deploy is the Nginx image, the latest version. You should probably not use latest. You probably should define the version for different reasons, but like you can do that. And I'm gonna say, hey, uh, I'm gonna be able to access the Nginx server on port 80 within my pod. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna do kubectl, apply, dash F, which is like basically a hey, file. The next thing I'm gonna share is a file. That is the YAML file that I've shown you. And before I do that, let me just show you, where am I on key3D? So let me do kpods A. So pods is, again, the smallest unit within my cluster. Dash A is because there is a thing called namespace. So I'm just saying like, show me all the namespaces. I'm gonna tell you just a little more about that after be patient. So just to show you, like there is a bunch of like default stuff that were created with Key3D, no Nginx there. You know, I'm uh, not a magician and I'm not faking it. So uh, kubectl, I'm gonna do apply, dot half Nginx. And what's gonna happen? The deployment got created. So in theory, if I do kpods dot hey, you're gonna see now, I don't know if it's big enough, you're gonna see now that in the default namespace, I, if I have a container that is being created and my Nginx server is being deployed. So the third tool I'm gonna to talk to you about is gonna help you to show the status of your cluster and stuff because like always getting like K get pods to see the status, it's like a little bit like annoying. But now you see it's running. Another object I could use right now because my Nginx server is not accessible for me, it's not accessible outside of my nodes right now. Uh, so what I want to do, and it's not the best way to do that for something in production, but just for the sake of the demo, uh, I can do some port forwarding. I'm gonna be lazy on this one. Actually, I need the exact name here. So what's happening with the name here is that I call it, I call it Nginx, and uh, there is some kind of like UID that were created for me, uh, because within the uh, same namespace, you cannot have the same name, so Kubernetes created like a UID for me after the name. So here, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use K again, uh, kubectl again, and I'm gonna say, I'm, I'm gonna use a common call port forwarding, and I'm gonna say for the pod, call nginx dash whatever, whatever it's written there. I'm gonna say, hey, localhost on the localhost on my machine, let me access the port 8080, that will point to my pod, my nginx pod, to the port 80. So if I go enter here, it's kind of like blocking my terminal because now it's, it's in port forwarding mode. And if I go in my browser and I go localhost 8080, I have Nginx working. Is it not the most beautiful application you've ever seen? Yeah, don't be too excited about that. So that's one way of deploying. The second way of deploying an application is through Helm. Actually, there is a lot of, uh, there's some other ways to deploy, but like this is your second best friend, it's gonna be Helm. Helm is another CLI tool that's gonna help you to basically do two things. If you want, it's gonna help you to package application so you, your team, or other people publicly, if you put them publicly in what we call chart repo. Uh, that, so that's gonna help you to package your application in a chart and be able to use the command line without having to play with the YAML itself. You're gonna play with the chart and it's gonna help you to either create that chart or install your application with a chart. And I see faces and then people are like, what the fuck he's talking about? Give me one second. So if I go here, uh, what I do, I have a, whoop, not my email. I have an application, uh, not application, a good website to check the most of the packages that are available publicly is uh, artifacthub.io. And I go here and I say, you know what? 
I want to install Nginx. Is there like already packages of Nginx so I don't have to create my own YAML file? And usually they are better built with different objects that you need to be successful. So here, there is Bitnami that is like probably the company that is like, uh, I think it's Oracle doing that. Like they're publishing so many, so many packages out there. And I'm saying like, hey, you know what? There is an Nginx package. So there is the install here that explained me how to do that. So I installed the Elm CLI on my computer. What I need to do first, I need to tell the CLI, hey, like now have access to that chart repository. So I'm going to do Helm repo had bitnami. Uh, I forgot to remove it before the, the show, so now it's not working because it's already there. But let's say it was successful. It had it, this repo within my own personal local ecosystem. The next step I should do, and again, now it's not going to work because I did not remove it. The first thing you need to do after that is Helm repo update. Because for whatever reasons, when you had a repo, I always thought that it should update automatically so you have already access to the content. It doesn't work like that. So you do Helm repo update. It's going to go through all the repos that you had, update them to see the last version. Let me kill this one. After that, what I want to see is like, OK, uh, Nginx, which I don't know how to write Nginx. I can search to, to say search repo. I can search for Nginx, like now do I have like Nginx chart uh, accessible to my Elm tool. So now I see I have three. And I was like, hey, you know what? This is the one I want to install. It's called bitnami-nginx. Uh, uh, this is the chart version, and this is the application version. Those can be different, meaning that like the application version is the version, is the version of Nginx. The chart is like, hey, I can deploy the same application quite often. I made a bug. I, I added an object like an ingress uh, controller to make Nginx uh, automatically accessible from the outside world or stuff like that. Uh, so I can deploy chart as many as often as I want, which give me uh, that kind of version number. So first, let me remove the Nginx that I installed manually. So there is another common call, kubectl delete dash f, again, for file, nginx yaml. So kubectl is going to look at my yaml file. It's going to look, hey, does he have a, de a deployment that is called nginx? Should I remove that? Boom. Should not be there anymore. If I do kget pods, kget pods, oh, actually, kget pods, hey, you're going to see that like nginx disappear. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to be lazy again. Uh, I can do elm install. I call my installation whatever I want. Again, I'm a simple person. I'm going to call it Nginx. I say, this is the chart that I want to install. This is the version that I want to install. So the flag, I'm using the flag version. If I don't want to, I think it's, uh, if I remember, it's going to install the latest version. I can define the namespace where I want to install it. And I'm going to tell you just about that right after. But bear with me. And I use the flag create namespace. Because if I want manually, if I wanted to manually install Nginx like I did with the apply on YAML file, and I decided to do apply dash, uh, dash n or dash dash namespace Nginx before, it would have tell me like, hey, you know what? The namespace does not exist. There is no Nginx namespace. Elm give you the opportunity to create it if it does not exist. So I click enter here, and now there's a lot more things because that chart contains the deployment that I showed you, plus a lot more other things, even though some, a little bit of explanation about like how to use the chart once it's deployed. So if I go back to, OK, let me go kgetpod without the dash a. If I go hey, here, let's say no resources found in default namespace, because right now I'm in the default namespace. A namespace is a way to group and isolate different resources together. And you're going to see this about everything and anything in Kubernetes. It is super annoying at the beginning, really useful when you, can, when you kind of like get to use to always like either use like the option to get all namespace or switch namespace. Or if I go kgetpod-a, I'm going to see all namespace. But I can say dash n, nginx. And I'm going to see just the pods that are in the nginx namespace. So really useful feature. Now Nginx is running. Let me show you that it's running. But by doing that, let me show you the third tool that should be your best friend. So it's not a CNCF project. Uh, it's still open source. It's still on GitHub. Uh, on GitHub, it's called Canines. 
which at the beginning I was calling K9S until uh, one of my coworkers was like, dude, this is like K9 plural. I was like, yeah, make way more sense. So K9S or K9s, uh, when you run it, it's a good mix between, now let me maximize that a little bit. Can you see in the back? Ish, yeah. And that tool is not super good though when you zoom that much. Is it better? Yeah. It's fine if you don't like read all the words. What I want to show you is that this thing makes me use kubectl mostly never for most of the thing. Because that's a mix between like a UI tool for the terminal. So here I'm showing all the pods within my namespace. And I have all the information plus some other information that I didn't have when I was getting get pods. So there is a way for me to get more details, but like the default comment doesn't give me everything. And what I can do, I can navigate between object. Show me just the namespaces. So I did uh, colon, namespaces. Now it's shown me the namespaces, and I can say like, hey, I want to see only what is in the Nginx pod. But there is other objects that are chart deployed. So if I do colon, and I say, hey, I want to see services. I click there, there's a load balancer that was installed for me. So this is why sometimes installing the chart is just make your life easier because you don't have to write all that YAML, you know, for default application that for sure you're gonna use. Again, you want to deploy WordPress, there is a chart for it there. Instead of you trying to find the right image, write the YAML, which is nice at the beginning, you want to do that to learn. But at some point you're just like, hey, I'm just gonna Elm install my application and that's gonna be there. And that tool is great. If I go back to pods, actually to pod, oh, I'm in the, the Elginx namespace, and uh, I can also search. I'm going to search everything that is uh, Nginx. I don't know how to write Nginx most of the time. Uh, Nginx, and now it's going to list everything. So that tool is really amazing. But the other thing, remember when I did the port forward, it was blocking my terminal. It's a little bit annoying. And you can do one port forward at a time if you use kubectl, unless you need to like run the uh, port forwarding as a background task, and like it's just a pain in the ass, uh, to be honest. So here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go on the service, because that's my loss balancer now. And actually, not this one. Uh, let me go to the service. And I'm going to go in Nginx. And now you don't see it, because that interface is not super good when you zoom it, but there's an option called Shift F on my load balancer, and now I can say like, hey, you know what? The load balancer is running on 8080 compared to like the server running just on uh, port 80, and I'm gonna say I want to port forward, and I can do other stuff after that. Now I can go back to namespace, and the port forward, actually namespace, and the port forward is still working. I don't know how to type today. So if I go here again, I have Nginx again working. Another amazing application. Huh? That deserve a round of applause now. That is the most beautiful application you have. So anyway, that tool is really amazing because that let, helped me do that. And the other thing that it helps me do, if, if I go to, let's go back here, and uh, what I want to do, I want to understand what is that pod. Like, what is, what is that pod? I can click D, and that's going to describe that pod. So every information about the pod is going to be there. Everything, I can do everything. I click on the hill, I get the logs from that pod. Everything is in within that tool. So it's K9s. As I said, it's one of the tools that I love the most. To be honest, right now, I don't remember half of the kubectl comments that I should do to do the same kind of things most of the time because now I use K9s. So it's still important. I talked to you about kubectl because that's the basic. This is what you need to be successful. But K9s is going to help you to navigate your cluster, get the information. Uh, I can even like kill the pod, and I click K. It killed the pods, and now the pods already. Oh, is it K? I cannot see. I think it's K. I oh, know it's control K. I know something was wrong. So I can kill the pod here, uh, and I'm going to show you a little more how it's working, but you're going to see the pod uh, restart again, and uh, that's going to work like that. So K9s is one of the tools that I like the most. Uh, the main contributor, Italian guy, super nice, super sweet. Uh, no, actually, it's uh, not for that technology. I don't know the main maintainer of this one, but like, just a great technology. It's open source. It's again, it's a CLI. Uh, you need to get used to CLI to terminal. I don't know for you. I'm a big 
terminal lover. I love everything that I can do in the command line. Not everybody do, and I respect that. But the thing with Kubernetes is that you don't really have the choice because most of the tools that's going to help you to be successful within the cloud native ecosystem are things that run in the terminals. You have some UI that can help you to do stuff. Uh, there is some actions that you can do within your public cloud provider, but again, most of the thing run on the terminal. So there was the third tool that should be or that could be your best friend if you decide to go uh, the, um, the cloud native way. Actually, let me go back here. There's another tool. It's not in the talk, but um, I don't even, because I use that tool, I don't even remember how to switch uh, from context uh, within, why is that? What is D? Anyway, I should not do allow, but um, I don't even remember how to switch like context because what is great is that usually you don't even you don't have just one cluster. You can have multiple cluster, and uh, one way to connect most of the tool from your CLI to your cluster is a file called kubeconfig, which gets you the information about your cluster and how to connect to it. So, uh, as an example, earlier I created a cluster in Sivo that should be ready. It's called Sivo Demo. Two ways I could get the cube config is that there's a download button here, but what I can do, I have the Sivo uh, CLI install, and there's a comment called Sivo. You don't have to know. It's, it's not about, uh, the talk is not about Sivo, but just to s tell you, uh, I do Sivo Kubernetes config, Sivo demo, which is the name of my cluster. I'm going to save the cube config, and you're going to see my prompt will change. Now I'm connected to my Sivo demo cluster, the one that I created before. Let me switch that again a little bit higher. If I go in K9 now, my firewall is going to ask me, is it OK? It's OK. And now you're going to see it's a little bit different, because now I'm connected to my Sivo cluster that I created before. If I want to switch, there is a real nice tool called uh, kubectx. Uh, that is also a way where I could have said, like, kubectx, cube first, Fred, and would have switched the context for me to my new cluster. Or there is that little UI thing where I can say, like, hey, I'm going to connect to another cluster I have called cube first, Fred. And here, if I go in K9, it's a cluster that I created with cube first. And you're going to see there is a lot more thing in that cluster. Uh, so it was just to show you a little more, uh, actually, like the K9 interface, where now I have like all those namespaces. We install like Chart Museum, Crossplane, Cert Manager, Vault, Hargo, uh, CD, which is a CD pipeline uh, that can be really useful for your cloud native journey. And uh, just to show you the interface, but also for my next demo, I wanted to finish with hopefully something fun, something I like. Uh, tell you a little more about like the self healing part of Kubernetes. Uh, do you know what chaos engineering is? It's basically what it said. It's chaos engineering. It's created chaos within your ecosystem. It's a way to test if your uh, system is going to work if uh, some shit happen. So basically what happened, I think it's Netflix who coined the term. Uh, basically, they just like killed services right or wrong, like randomly, and like they like remove some, some stuff in the firewall. Like they do a lot of things that you should not do on your server. And by doing that, Prevent, like, is it a word preventively? Prevently? Is it a word in English? Yeah, I don't know. Prevently? It's a word? Yeah, people, okay. Yeah, yeah. So by doing that before it happened, yeah, I should have said that. By doing that before it happened, it helps you to see if your system is going to be still working or at least ending well issues that could happen. So instead of like it happens when there is like millions of people watching a show, you know before that like if there is part of system, like if my API server goes down for like, I don't know, getting the description of the movie or the list of the movie you have access in your country, what's going to happen? Like if everything's going to be on fire or is there like a service B that's going to be able to take over and do the, that kind of stuff? So anyway, it's about creating chaos in your ecosystem to understand where are the point of failures within your ecosystem. So real nice thing to do and painful thing to do also, because that also show where you have weaknesses within your ecosystem. So with that said, I'm going to use another open source tool called Cube Invader. And before I do that, let me go back in K9s. Actually, let me try to zoom that enough. Okay, K9. 
Can you see good enough in the back? Actually, like that. What you're going to look here, it's the status of the pods running in my kube first thread Kubernetes cluster. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to use kube invader that I install on that same cluster before the talk. And I love that thing. It's a game. And it's like invaders, like there is space invaders. But the invaders, there are the resources within my, in that case, I selected my development namespace. And now I have like all those, I don't know if you see them. It's not zooming for whatever reasons. But anyway, you see those little Halion uh, at the top. And I have my spaceship here. And I'm going to kill part of my resources in my cluster. But look, canines. Uh, hopefully, no, it's not a good example. I don't know where I am right now. Let me go to, that is so big. Let me go to development. And OK, now I'm seeing all the pods. Let me scroll. Hopefully, I'm going to kill the one that are in the viewport here. But I'm going to be a bad guy. And I'm going to kill some of the resources. And you can see them in Cuban Inverter. They just die. Poor, poor little cube first resources. But look, canines, right? I'm going to try to kill a little more. So you can see them. You can see some of those resources, the pods. Actually, those are just pods. I'm showing you all, all the pods. They're being killed. They're being terminated. And Kubernetes is just taking over. You say, like, hey, Fred, something's wrong. <laughs> and it's just starting the pods again. So in the end, if I go back here, I killed a lot of them. I think I, I think it was not bad. You're going to see like most of them should be running now. Obviously, uh, some are completed because they were like just like things that needed to do some stuff and like they're not needed anymore. But the one running, they're still running. And I killed them. Like I was really not nice with them. I killed them. They're still running. They're back. It was fast because those is like smaller application. It can take a little more time. But what's great is that in the case like here, if I kill, I have one, two, three, four, five. So I have a replica set with five development, uh, actually four, uh, because the other one is API, uh, development pods. So if I kill those two, three, the way I put my, I created my Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes were like, hey, life is good. I still have pods running, and I'm, they're going to send people to the right pods. So this is, the, this is an example of the self-healing part and the high availability of Kubernetes that I really like to demo. On that note, I hope you're not like Fred. I don't know if I still. I don't know if I understand Kubernetes, and it's kind of okay. I made peace with the fact that like not everybody at the end of the talk would be like, okay, now I know Kubernetes. Because again, I shown you a small part. We only had an hour together, but it's only the beginning. Hopefully, you understand a little more what it is, how to deploy application, how to get started to do the basic thing you needs to do. And the good thing is that with any complicated technology. You start at the beginning, you try it a little bit, you messed up, it's fine. You create another cluster, you try it, you, you create another cluster. It's way easier than, I don't know for how long you're being in tech, but like, it's a little more painful than like just connecting uh, with a FTP client to my server and uploading new version, which we're doing like a long time ago. That was so fast, that was good. But like, if something was not working on the server, God, that was terrible. That was like a pain to fix things working on the server. Right now, Something's not working. I create a new plug. I delete my deployment. Deploy it again, because it's working within my container. It's a lot more easier. So some resources. Kubernetes.io, it's your main place. It's the website, the official website. The documentation is there. I suggest you, maybe not, like I know some people just like, hey, I'm going to read the docs. I'm going to be a happy person. No, you won't be an happy person. That docs is like so huge. It's good, but like it's so huge. So I suggest you, if you want to know more, try it or uh, find some tutorials online, a Udemy course. Uh, there is a lot of good things out there. If you need help, you're a little bit lost in your journey. There is like three main Slack places, the CNCF one, the Kubernetes one, uh, because there is two. There is like in CNCF, there is all the project, but there is a Kubernetes channel. I think it may be a little bit better to go to the Kubernetes Slack itself, because there's channels for specific things about Kubernetes. And the last one, uh, it's the Cube First one. Uh, even if you don't use our product, we have a Kubernetes channel. We're just friendly people. If you need help, uh, sometimes it's a little less, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, asking a question in a channel where there is like a couple of thousands of people versus we have like three or four hundred members, uh, it's a little bit nicer. And the community's channel is really low because most people in the community ask for uh, Cube first question. But anyway, we're just, just saying that we're friendly folks. The tools that I share about today, uh, except kubectx, uh, which is also a uh, uh, open source tool. I didn't put the link here because I didn't thought I was uh, going to use it. But uh, just look, look for kubectx uh, on GitHub. Uh, K3D, K9s, uh, kubectl. It's part of, again, it's part of the docs. When you read about the docs, they tell you to install that. Uh, Cube Invaders that I use, Helm. And uh, I put Cube first here. And this is my one minute product pitch. Uh, what you've seen before, it's a cluster that I created with Cube first. The easiest part of Kubernetes is to create your cluster. It's after that you need something to manage your secrets. You need something to manage your CD pipeline. You need something to manage the certificate. You need something to manage the external access. You need something to manage, like if you do uh, infrastructure as code. You need all those things to manage just to be able to deploy your application with Kube First. It's free, it's open source. That helps you to create a production ready cluster uh, in most of the public clouds that have all those tools already installed and pre-configured, but also use uh, something called GitOps. Speaking about the CD pipeline, if you're still here tomorrow, I give another talk in this exact room at Elven 45, but it's about Argo CD. Argo CD is, again, an open source, but cloud native based CD pipeline that you want to use if you go to the community's journey. On top of that, it's built with GitOps in mind, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about today, which is one way to manage your Kubernetes cluster. So there is a talk about this tomorrow. And on that note, my name is Fred. Uh, I think I'm going to have like time for maybe, I don't know, one question. But uh, if we don't have time that much for question, I'm going to be out of the room right after my talk if you have to. Uh, if you have question, you can send me an email, fred at kubefirst.io. Does my cat look so nice? It's one of my cat. I love her. She's so nice. Uh, anyway, uh, always Twitter. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, if we don't have the time to chat, if you try Kube for, uh, Kubernetes in the future, and we have the name is so close, like everything. This is the thing you need to get used to. In the Kubernetes space, every tool is K something or Q something. So sometimes it's just like you just lose the name. But anyway, uh, I offer free coffee chat. You can schedule at fred.dev slash coffee, 30 minutes call with me, video chat. We can talk about Kubernetes. We can talk about Argo CD. We can talk about cats. We can talk about whatever you want uh, just to get to know each other. I'm a friendly person. I know I doesn't look like that, but uh, I'm a friendly person. So on that note, hopefully it was not too mind blowing. It was helping uh, helpful a little bit. And thanks for your time and have a good rest of the conference, everybody.